Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you all to Wellness Wednesday here provided by Recovery Resources. Um, I know it's cold and chilly outside, but hopefully everyone is staying warm. Um, we have our special guest today, uh, Pastor Matt Johnson, who's going to be talking to us about um, some of his work and the activities he done, he's done uh, with journaling um, for mental health and mental wellness. I also want to encourage you, today is Random Acts of Kindness Day. So it, throughout your day, find a moment to share a kind word or, or um, do a kind deed for someone else just to continue to spread kindness within our community. So I will begin by um, also letting you know Everyone will be kept on mute uh, so that we're able to, you know, hear Pastor Matt without interruptions. If you have a question that you want to put in the chat, just drop that into the chat box and we'll be monitoring that and we'll have some times for a question and answer at the end as well. So um, I do want to, you know, welcome Pastor Matt and thank you, thank him for speaking for us today. Um, Matt Johnson is a 37-year-old Christian pastor in South Florida at House of Love Ministries but he was originally born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, yes. He's also the founder of Journaling Saves Lives, which is a mental health advocacy organization. In his professional life, Matt works as a human resource associate for Cleveland Clinic, Florida, in Western Florida. During his 13-year tenure with this organization, he has acquired 11 plus years of training, coursework, and experience in the disciplines of emotional social intelligence, obesity sensitivity, workplace harassment prevention, suicide prevention, racial diversity and inclusion, as well as conflict management and resolution. Matt has also received special specialty training in LGBTQ patient-centered care. He is a husband and father-to-be that enjoys weightlifting and walks on the beach. Thank you so much, Pastor Matt. All right, so thank you everyone. Uh, for tuning in to this presentation, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Uh, some of you all may be able to see I am on the beach, but I'm really inside of my home. Uh, but it really does look like this here in South Florida. So uh, I cannot share any sentiments about that bad weather you all have up north. Uh, but nevertheless, <clears throat> uh, we're going to be talking about today. Uh, this is Black History Month. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm grateful for this wonderful organization for having me. Uh, to do this presentation. Uh, and we're gonna be talking about the powerful tool of journaling, all right? The powerful tool of journaling. I'm not sure how many people uh, regular, regularly, <laughs> tongue tied a little bit, uh, engage in journaling, but it is a, it, it's a powerful thing that can yield uh, great results for your mental and emotional health, all right? And so I'm just going to give a little bit about myself. As mentioned, uh, I am the founder of Journaling Saves Lives, which is a Christian-based mental health advocacy organization. Uh, and we founded it in 2016, as I mentioned, as it was mentioned, due to a desire to see people take a more proactive approach to their mental and emotional health. And it's important that I make that known because being a pastor, uh, a lot of times people that I come across uh, just feel like everything is just a spiritual matter, but we are a uh, spirit. Uh, soul and body, and so we have to have a holistic and a holistic approach <clears throat> to the care that we take for ourselves. And so this is why I really, uh, you know, since 2016 have just been going so hard with helping people to understand like, yes, you may be taking care of your the spiritual part of your life, but you have an emotional and you have a mental part that you also need to take equal care of. Now we do facilitate mental and emotional health education and awareness seminars for the general public, uh, because one of the things I found out is the general public as a whole um, is at a deficit with regards to proper mental and emotional health education, thus the reason so many stigmas exist. And so one of the reasons why we do these seminars is so that we can uh, be an, an influential factor in eliminating these stigmas because we want proper, the more we can eliminate stigmas from the mental and emotional health arena, the more help people will be more apt to get on time, all right? Now, we also serve as a liaison that connects individuals and families uh, who are directly and indirectly, because you may not be one that's directly affected by any mental or emotional health disorder, but if you have family, you have friends, you have loved ones who are, then guess what? 
uh, if you're not careful and you don't put up the right boundaries and, and have the right uh, outlets for yourself, then it can become a firsthand experience as well. Now, <clears throat> uh, although we are a Christian-based organization, I do want to make it known that <clears throat> ethically we assist any and everyone that reaches out to us for any type of assistance. Okay, and so we're we're not biased with who uh, we lend our uh, resources to or make the connections with. All right. So now, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, I will ask that everybody place, you know, any cell phones or your devices on vibrate or silent. Uh, keep your, as it was mentioned at the beginning, please keep your, your phones on or your devices on mute uh, because I believe it is being recorded. Be respectful of the comments and the opinions of each other. Everyone has, comes from a different walk of life and may have something different to contribute. And we just want to make everyone's opinion feel welcome because it is, all right? Uh, utilize the raised hand emoji to ask questions or if you want to make comments and just simply participate. This is what I call a, an interactive uh, lecture. And so I'm not that one that just lectures for the whole uh, 30, 45 minutes or an hour, or whatever the time limit is, and then just ask for questions at the end. So we're going to do some things and I'm going to ask some questions and, and require some participation so that we can engage one another to make the most of our time together on today. All right. So now, I do, I like to do at the beginning what I call an icebreaker exercise. And the purpose of this exercise is this. It tests our memory capabilities as well as our ability to be mindful of what we're doing at all times and not simply being on the go. When you're constantly on the go and you're not mindful and aware of what you're doing at any given time, because some of us just go, 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 and we're not mindful of what we're doing and what we're engaging in. And that's often one of the greatest ways how mental and emotional burnout comes about, all right? And so one of the things I wanna do in this exercise, I'm gonna ask, you have three minutes, uh, pull out some paper, ink pen, uh, pencil or paper, and I want you to write down what you were doing yesterday. Today is the 17th, but what were you doing yesterday, uh, Tuesday, February 16th at 8, 8 o'clock in the morning, 1 p.m., 5 p.m., and 8 p.m. I know you may be saying, wow, wow why are we doing this? Well, I just explained the purpose of the uh, exercise. And so we're going to start in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Start writing down what you were doing yesterday at 8 in the morning, 1 p.m., 5 p.m., and 8 p.m. And I would like everybody to participate. You can use your device. You can use a pen and paper. But I would like everybody to participate. may require us to do some thinking very hard, even though it was just yesterday. Uh, but this is a lesson that, you know, I try to drive home. Like I'm, I'm a firm believer in mental and emotional wellness, and we need to be mindful of what we're doing again at every given moment and not just being on a go, 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 go. All right. You have two minutes. And those that are just coming in, being admitted, the information is on the screen. You got, you still have two minutes. Just jot down what you were doing yesterday at eight o'clock in the morning, 1 p.m., 5 p.m., and 8 p.m. And then we have a debriefer question once we're done with this exercise. Got about a minute and a half, a little less. Hope you're getting your uh, brain cells working, getting your, testing out your memory capabilities. I would hope that everyone would know what they were doing at those times yesterday. I, mean, I could have asked like, what were you doing at those times two weeks ago, but that wouldn't be fair. <laughs> And you'll see a correlation, the more mindful you become uh, with the use of your time, being aware of what you're doing at all times. And again, not just being on the go, go, go. You will find less tension and less stress with regards to your mental and emotional health. 
it is a direct correlation between stress, your mental and emotional health, and always being on the go uh, without giving any cognitive reasoning to what you're doing at any given moment. All right, we have about 40 seconds. Thirty seconds. I'm probably counting down faster than I need to, but that's okay. <laughs> Twenty seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Time's up. <clears throat> All right. Now, what I would like for everybody to do, I will probably because I don't, I don't believe, I don't know if I can see. I can't see the chat function, but what I would like for you all to do, and I'll have maybe one of the <clears throat> one of the people from the organization to read off the comments, but I want everybody to just put in the comments, how did you feel, those that actually did this icebreaker exercise, how did you feel about engaging in this exercise? Remember I said the purpose of the exercise was to test your memory capabilities, as well as your ability to be mindful, <clears throat> help you to be mindful of what you're doing at all times and not simply being on the go. So just a quick little sentence or two. How did you feel about engaging in this exercise? You can still uh, hear, but if you go into the comments, you can leave your comment. I'll give about 15 to 20 seconds for people to drop your comments. We, we want this to be interactive. So just go right into the chat and drop your comments. How did you feel about engaging in this exercise? And if we do have any comments pop in the um, comments field, I'll have uh, Amy or Diana, someone to go ahead and read them. So I'm gonna give you a few more seconds and then we're gonna get into the presentation. <clears throat> so if you drop any comments, you know, we'll try to take periodic pauses so that we can look to see what's in the chat feature. All right, now it is Black History Month, as I mentioned. Um, now, one thing I want to mention is Black History Month, obviously, as you can see on the screen, did not always exist, okay? Uh, in 1926, Carter G. Woodson termed the second week in February Negro History Week. His name was Carter G. Woodson. Uh, that will be somebody that you can do a little research project on. Uh, but it was because he noticed that, you know, no attention was being given to the accomplishments and the achievements of African Americans, all right? And then in 1976, uh, President Gerald Ford uh, felt bad that uh, African-American achievements and accomplishments were being overlooked, especially since they had such a great impact in society. And so he officially recognized uh, the month of February as Black History Month. So we went from a week to a month, all right? Uh, and the goal is to probably uh, be able to celebrate all of the achievements of the minorities throughout the year. All right, so since we are talking about uh, mental health, this is a Black History Mental Health presentation. I just kind of wanted to mention a few, a few names. I'm not sure if you all recognize these names, but let's start with Kenneth C. Clark. He is the first ever Black president of the American Psychological Association. He is most famous for his work in uh, the Brown versus Board of Education case, and I'm sure many of us are aware of that, uh, and his work in general to eliminate segregation in the school system. Uh, the next name you see is Solomon Fuller. He is the first Black psychiatrist to be recognized by the American Psychiatric Association, and his specialty was neurodegenerative diseases. The next name you'll see is Mamie Phipps Clark, and her husband is Kenneth Clark, the first name that was mentioned. She is the first ever Black female to receive a doctoral, a doc, doctorate, sorry, degree from Columbia University. Uh, and she is the inventor, not sure if you all ever heard of this, the famous Dow test, along with her husband, Kenneth Clark, which sought to measure the effects of racial segregation on children, all right? The next name you'll see is Maxi Clarence Maltzby Jr. He is the founder of Rational Behavior Therapy, all right? So these are some of the names that you know you can uh, read up on a little bit more to become well acquainted. Uh, the next name you'll see is Joseph L. White. He is the founder of Towards a Black Psychology, all right? A lot of these authors have very good uh, material and content out there. The next name, Beverly Daniel Tatum. She is the author of Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, all right? 
Uh, the, the last name you'll see on the screen, it says Inez Beverly Prosser. She is the first black woman to receive a PhD in psychology. So these are some, uh, just a few of the many black history mental health pioneers. Now, when I ask the question, do, does anyone else know any other black mental health pioneers that have made any headways in the field of mental health? If so, please go ahead and drop uh, this information in the comments. Again, we wanna try to make this interactive. So if you have a name uh, that, that has made headways in this field, that's a minority uh, that has contributed to black mental health, uh, then go ahead, please drop that in the comments, uh, and then we'll have someone to read some of the names off. Now, we want to get now into the meat of the presentation because we, we're ultimately, I'm ultimately going to talk to you about the powerful tool of journaling, okay? And so the question is asked, what is journaling, all right? As you see, you see four different concepts on the screen. It is a mechanism, an effective way a therapist recommended wellness tool, and it works as a process. And so I'm gonna uh, dive into this a little bit more so we can have better understanding because journaling, if, you're, if you don't already do it, is something that I want you to start engaging in uh, at starting at the conclusion of this presentation because I, I'm a firm believer that it works and it's such a powerful tool uh, for your mental and emotional health and your spiritual health as well. All right, but it's a mechanism that allows individuals to outlet challenging and overwhelming emotions, feelings, and thoughts. I'm going to say that again. Journaling is a mechanism that allows individuals uh, to outlet challenging and overwhelming emotions, feelings, and thoughts. All right. And so the general, I would say the most common um, response to stressors or when things are challenging and overwhelming for the average person is for them to internalize things. And see, the internalizing things is, a, is an enemy to journaling. Journaling seeks to prevent people from internalizing because as you know, when you internalize any stress, uh, it becomes distress and then your health starts to become affected and so forth. And so one of my assignments as it relates to pushing this concept of journaling is to teach people that this is a viable way, a healthy way to outlet so that you don't have to keep all of the stress, all of the pain, all of the sorrow internalized. You don't have to hold on to all of these challenging uh, feelings and emotions, but there is a way that you can outlet, all right? Now, uh, number two, an effective way. Journaling is an effective way to pinpoint and track stressors, triggers, and to formulate strategies to better control them. You're not gonna get better uh, just through osmosis. And so it requires some effort, some strategic effort uh, on our part. And so when you take some time out to journal, uh, it, it allows, like I said, it allows you to write down and make that connection and say, okay, I see what's causing stress in this area. I see what this stressor is. I see what triggers me in this area. And then now once you put that on paper and you've identified, now you can begin uh, to try to mitigate these things, to try to find ways to overcome or navigate around. But when you don't journal, you don't write these things down, it's, it's very difficult uh, to begin to make these connections, okay? Uh, number three, uh, it is a therapist-recommended wellness tool that helps people to do three main things, not the only things, but three main things. Manage anxiety, and if you didn't know, anxiety is the number one most common mental illness. People think that it is depression, but it is actually anxiety. And just so you know, you cannot box anxiety into one. Uh, I mean, you can summarize it by saying anxiety, but there are many different anxiety disorders. All right. Uh, but number two, it helps to reduce stress overall. So it helps you to manage it, manage your anxiety of whatever sort, whatever origin. Uh, it helps you to reduce stress overall, and it helps you to cope with depression and, and or depressive symptoms because you can be dealing with depressive symptoms, but not really uh, have been diagnosed with clinical depression, all right? And depression is the number two most common uh, mental illness, mental health disorder. Now let's uh, continue on. Uh, journaling works as a process, all right? It works as a process by which individuals can relinquish, all right? Let go of negative and pessimistic thoughts, feelings, ideas, uh, and behaviors while cultivating optimistic and positive ones. So the whole goal is when you're outletting, uh, and we use journaling again as a way so that you don't have to internalize uh, the cares of life. And so 
whatever negativity that you have inside or any pessimism. The goal is through journaling that you're able to relinquish those and find and cultivate more positive and more optimistic thoughts and feelings and ideas and things of that nature. Now, I want to talk about now journaling's place with other tools. Now, one thing I do want to mention is that journaling is just one aspect, as you see, it's one aspect of a broader range of healthy lifestyle habits, okay? And in order to maximize the benefits of journaling, there are other things you must put into practice in your life. Journaling is not the cure-all. Even as I uh, often have a lot of conversations with my therapists and my uh, other friends who are counselors, grief counselors, mental health therapists from all walks of life, and um, I tell them, I said, listen, I said, I said, we can journal all day, but if we don't have uh, other healthy habits or wellness tools in place, then it's almost like you're going to be journaling to try to have that outlet, but you're also being an enemy to yourself on this side. And so the more you're an enemy to yourself, it's like you're journaling, but now you're becoming an enemy to yourself on this side. So we have to make sure that we put up boundaries and put up put up other wellness tools and things in place. So the first thing I want to mention is in order to maximize the benefits of journaling, people should also engage in daily meditation. Now, let me help you all with something. <clears throat> meditation, it don't, don't think of like what we would presume to be the, the stigma of it. Like you just, hmm. that's a form of it, you know, but meditation is simply means to give your brain a break to practice mindfulness, to, to try to get yourself centered because we live in a society that enforces with its whole heart being on the go, grind, grind, grind. You can sleep when you're dead, but when you don't get enough sleep, you just might die. And so I teach people along with journaling to take those regular periods where you let your mind calm down, you get yourself centered, okay? That, that is a very great companion of journaling. <clears throat> also sleep and periods of rest. Sleep and rest are not the same thing, you all, because you can you can be sleep but not be rested, okay? Because some of us will get eight hours of sleep and wake up and we'll still be tired. Why? Because most often than not, that's contributed to uh, the influx of technology that we bombard ourselves with before we go to bed. But let's start with rest. Rest means to uh, have cessation from activity. You need to learn how to just sit down and, and just calm down and just cease all activities. We, we know we have so many responsibilities and things, but, but I'm an enforcer to help people to get a proactive grip on their mental and emotional health. And if you're going to do that, you have to take periods of rest. You may not want to go to sleep. It's okay to sit on your couch. It's okay to sit on your patio. It's okay to sit in your car. Just to kind of take that rest. Let your body rest. You don't, you're not moving a muscle. You're just sitting back. Even if you lay your head back in the seat of your car, if you go to the beach, whatever, it's just important that you rest. And when it comes to sleep, people, you have to start sleeping. I hear people so often say, I can get three hours of sleep and I'm good. I'm ready to fly like a kite. No, you're not. In your mind, you think you are, but your body is saying something else. Every adult should be getting between six and eight hours of sleep, okay? And so it's very important because this is how your body replenishes, how you re-energize yourself. And the reason why I touched on technology is because some of us, up until the time we close our eyes and we doze off, we've got technology in our face, Facebook, social media, uh, <clears throat> Instagram, Twitter, uh, Snapchat, TikTok. We have all of the, these things bombarding. We're watching YouTube videos. We're watching Netflix. We've got this stuff in our face. And then when we go to sleep, we're still not really rested. And so one of the things I recommend when it comes to your sleep is that Cut off all technology about 15 minutes before you think you're about to fall asleep, okay? So if I'm getting in the bed at 10 o'clock, I'm not, you know, I don't particularly know, quote unquote, when I'm going to fall asleep, but I, I may look at something for about five or 10 minutes, but I'm cutting it off. And then that's my time to be in my bed or wherever I'm sleeping at, could be on a couch, whatever the case is. And that's my time to relax, relax and rest before I go to sleep. Because if you just bombard yourself with technology, 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 that has an adverse effect on your mental and emotional health, all right? Because in order to have good mental and emotional health, to have a proactive grip on that, you need to be sleepy. Because when you don't get enough sleep, your reaction times are delayed. You become irritable and so forth. You don't have as much energy as you think you ought to have. So it's very important, you all. Uh, and if you didn't, if you didn't realize, I, I, 
you know, I'm a firm believer in getting a whole lot of sleep, all right? Now, exercise and proper nutrition, people, again, uh, I'm an enforcer of journaling, but I'm an enforcer of having great, healthy uh, lifestyle habits. You have to exercise. A sedentary lifestyle is a friend of mental and emotional health problems and disorders. A sedentary lifestyle, all right? It does not do anything good for anybody, just being a couch potato, all right? Even if you stretch, even if you just take a walk or if you got a treadmill in your house or you walk around your neighborhood or you're doing push-ups and sit-ups or you're doing body weight squats, do something each day to be active, some form of exercise and then proper nutrition. What you are putting in your body has, is, has a direct correlation, all right, to your mental and emotional well-being. You can't bombard yourself with unhealthy things and, and, and all of that and think that you're going to still operate out of clear thought or settled emotions. Yes, the foods you put in your body, the liquids that you drink, the sodas and, and the fast foods, all of that can have an adverse effect on your mental and emotional health. And you may be journaling, but if you drown yourself with McDonald's and Pepsi, then, you know, guess what? Then it's almost like you're you're still making yourself. You're not going to really be able to make problems because now you're doing something that's adverse to your mental and emotional well-being while at the same time having uh, a good mental and emotional healthy habit. And so you still make yourself, all right? <clears throat> Refraining from drugs and alcohol. The reason why I'm an enforcer of journaling, meditation, sleep and periods of rest, exercise and proper nutrition is because these are adaptive ways to cope with stress in life. And when you don't have the correct adaptive behaviors, then what happens? We drift into maladaptive behaviors, all right? Uh, such as drugs, alcohol, and some of the other things. It's not just limited to this, but my goal is to help us take more a more proactive approach with uh, setting up and having uh, adaptive behaviors, wellness tools in place to help us deal with the, the, the grunt of, that life brings on a day-by-day -day basis. Now, I wanna ask a question. If you have some thoughts or comments to add about this question, please drop them in the comment field. What are some other healthy lifestyle habits uh, besides meditation, sleep and periods of rest, exercise, proper nutrition, refraining from alcohol and drugs? If you have some other things to contribute, you can drop them in the comments or you, know, or you can probably, and, and guess what? You may be able to even take your phone off of mute if you wanna mention something, that will be great too. So if anybody has anything, you can drop it in the comments now. What are some other healthy lifestyle habits? And this is something for you to reflect on because I don't want you to take this information in and just say, oh, this was a good presentation and you don't do anything with it, all right? We have to be doers of what we learn, not just hearers only, all right? Because when we hear and we don't do what we learn, then we leave ourselves at a deficit, all right? <clears throat> now I want to talk a little bit about uh, journaling tips and prompts, all right? journaling tips and prompts. So now, first, you actually have to set some time aside to journal. I'm, I'm gonna say that again. You have to set some time aside to journal. We are always on the go. We gotta grind, grind, grind. We gotta go here, we gotta go there, we gotta be here, we gotta be there, all right? And we don't set any time aside for the needful things. We don't set time aside for our journaling. We don't set time aside for our meditation, for our exercise, to, to get a good meal in. We have to start, just like we create time for uh, maladaptive behaviors, we have to create time for the wellness tools and the, uh, the, the, the tricks, the things that's gonna keep us uh, able to be well-minded and healthy adults. You have to create time. If you don't get anything else from this, create time for these healthy habits and these wellness tools on a daily basis, okay? No one schedule, hear this, no one schedule should ever be that jam-packed to the detriment of having time to unwind and gather your thoughts. If this is you, if your schedule every day is so jam-packed that you don't have time to get to a place where you can center yourself, to practice mindfulness, to rest and relax, then it is time for a change. All right, it doesn't matter who you are. This, I will stand behind 100% to anyone. If your schedule is that jam-packed, you need to free up some time that will allow you to engage in journaling, your meditation, your relaxation, and sleep and all of the other things, all right? Make some time. If you don't get nothing else, make some time. 
tell yourself that make some time. I will make some time. The more you tell yourself, the more it gets into your control center and you will be more apt to do it. All right. Secondly, journaling is most helpful uh, and effective when done in quiet, serene and peaceful environment. All right. If you aren't privy to this at home, because you may live with a thousand people, your children may be uh, firecrackers, they're very active and everything is just loud, loud, loud. Uh, you can always maybe consider visiting the library, going, going somewhere quiet to a rec center that may be open. Uh, and, you know, or if you work out of school, you may be able to stay extra time after school in one of the classrooms to get you some quiet time or even sitting in your car away from home. But it's important, all right, that, that because journaling, it would defeat the purpose if you're trying to sit there and unwind and center yourself and practice mindfulness and, and to outlet these challenging thoughts and, and, and ideas and frustrations that you have. Why is people running around? This one is calling you. That one is calling you. You're not going to be able to maximize the benefits of journaling if you're in a uh, distracting environment. So find somewhere where you can journal. Now that you've set time aside for it, all right? Uh, now you need to find the environment for it. Third, you need to be free and unrestrictive uh, with regards to your writing. Journaling doesn't need to follow. Hear this, it's very important. Journaling does not need to follow any type of structure, generally speaking. Write whatever's on your mind. Write whatever's, whatever you're feeling. Make sense of your emotions. You're just using this as an outlet so that you don't internalize and keep all of these frustrations inside. Let the words flow freely and without hesitation, okay? Journaling is a great way to prevent, as I said, internalizing. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about spelling. Don't worry about punctuation, all right? Just let the words flow because when I'm angry or I'm frustrated or I'm upset or I'm confused or I'm a little anxious about something, I don't care about sentence structure. I just need uh, the outlet. And so I'm just writing whatever comes to my head. If it's spelled wrong, oh well. I'm writing it so I can release myself from this so that I can begin to feel much better. Now, the fourth concept, remember that journaling, that your journal is private. Remember that your journal is private and it should be guarded with utmost diligence. You don't want to be careless with your journal as I'm sure there exists or will exist information in there that's highly sensitive that you don't want other people privy to. All right, now you may you may have in your mind like, man, I want to, I was so angry I could have ran that person over with a car or I'm so angry, man, I could have hit them with a stick. You don't want people reading that stuff that you're writing, but this is your way of outletting this. So this is another reason why you wanna be extra vigilant and diligent to uh, make sure that you Keep your journal in a safe place, a private place somewhere that you only have access to, that nobody will be able to go and say, oh, I know my mother keeps her journal in the upper drawer, left-hand corner next to her Chanel perfume. No, you don't want that. So make sure you guard this with the utmost diligence, okay? Now, the fifth uh, journal and tip and prompt. Be sure to keep an ink pen and notebook handy at all times because you never know when you will need to or even want to uh, jot down some quick thoughts. You never know when you'll need to uh, have that outlet, like something may just grab you and frustrate you and, and get you to the point of uh, intense anger. And you say, I need this outlet. I've been there. I, it was actually recent. We had a meeting at work and I something was said and, and just uh, the nonchalantness of some of the people, it, it angered me. And I knew I would not be able to continue to sit in that meeting as a well-minded adult, feeling the way that I was feeling. So guess what I did? You know, I was still listening, but I had my little notebook and I had my ink pen and it appeared that I, I was taking notes, but I was writing what I was thinking. I was writing my frustrations. And then about six minutes, I was good because I had that outlet. Now, had I tried to sit in that meeting and internalize all of that and still try to pay attention, I probably would have been at a deficit and I, that would have become a counterproductive meeting for me. And so this is why, because, and I know most of the time you may say, uh, well, when you had a meeting, you should have a notebook and pencil to take notes. But even when I'm out and about, like I, I, I keep a little one of the mini notebooks uh, and ink pen in my pocket at all times in my car. I got it at my desk, in my home, anywhere that I am in my briefcase, I have one. Because if I need to step away, I need to pull it out of my pocket 
or I call it my little switchblade. I just pull it out and I say, okay, I'm angry. Let me get this out of me. Even if I only have three or four minutes and I have I need to be somewhere and something is on my mind, it helps. I'm telling you all, please find some way. And some people utilize their devices, their, their electronic devices. Some people get in their car and they record their voice and, and outlet that way. You just need to make sure that you have some way to outlet at all times, whether it's pen paper, whether you use your phone to type notes, or whether you go in your car or somewhere private and use the voice recorder so that you can get it out. The whole point is, as you, if you all didn't realize, I'm trying to get you to not internalize. We're, we're trying to get you to have healthy outlets, all right? And now, the sixth thing I want to mention as it relates to journaling tips and prompts. Consistency is key. Y'all hear this? Consistency is key if you are to gain the most benefit from journaling, all right? There is no law to dictate how long and how often one should journal. However, I recommend, all right, this is just a recommendation of at least 15 minutes a day, seven days a week, 365 a year. That's just what I recommend because there is something uh, challenging that happens to us every day. Now, it may not be overwhelming, like some days may be a little bit more easier and manageable, but there is something that happens to us or confronts us, uh, some type of problem to be solved every single day. And sometimes if it's not as serious, then we kind of internalize that. You may say, oh, man. It made me a little mad, but I'm cool. No, you need to outlet that. It may not be as intense as that betrayal that you may have faced last week, but guess what? If it bothered you, then that's something that's going to be brewing. And what's going to happen? You're going to face another situation, and now you're going to create layers. So even if it's minor, you need to be consistent. Don't say, well, I journal today, and I, you know, it's today is Wednesday. I journal again on Saturday. No, 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Just set some time aside. It helps with mindfulness. It helps with outletting. It helps with, like I said earlier on, uh, tracking your stressors, making the connections, all right? So consistency is key, you all. One thing I want to ask, if you have any other uh, ideas about what are some other good environments and places to journal in, you can drop that uh, in the comment field as well. What are some other good places? Because again, I, you know, for me, uh, fortunately, being in Florida, uh, it, it's very convenient to, you know, even in post um, COVID era, you know, you strap on your mask and keep your sanitizer and spray. I keep all that with me at all times. Uh, but we're privy to go to the beach almost, I would say like 95% uh, of the year that we can go to the beach. And that that's a way there, you know, or I can go to libraries. I, there are different places, and, but I just want to make sure that you all would take a more vigilant approach and being mindful and saying, I need to set some time aside and I need to find a place that I can consistently do this at each day, all right? Now, journaling tips and prompts continue. Now, uh, journaling might take on, and, and generally speaking, as I, as I told you all, you, you need to be free and unrestrictive in your journaling, okay? But there are times where journaling just might take on a more structured approach, depending on what you're trying to accomplish and what connections you're trying to make. Because sometimes uh, you don't need to just outlet. You need to make some connections. You need to find, okay, I need to pinpoint what, what is the source of my stressors? What are my triggers? I need to make these connections. Like It seems like when I'm in this environment or around these type of people, this happens. These are the type of connections that we need to make if we're going to gain a proactive grip on our mental and emotional health. So with that being said, as I said, sometimes journaling has to take on a more structured approach, okay? And in consideration of those times, here are some general questions that can help to guide your thought process, that can help to keep you focused and not being scattered over here, over here, over here. What happened or what was said exactly? This forces you to be mindful. And this is this also forces you to create a scenario that's realistic to what actually happened. Because sometimes when something impacting or frustrating or upsetting or unsettling happens to you, that's what generally we do. We, we mix that with our emotions. And then we when we give an account of it, it's far from what happened in reality. And so with your journal, you can be honest. What, what did they really say to me? What did they really do to me? What happened and what was said exactly, all right? That's very important to make the proper connections. What was your initial response? This teaches you how to be mindful and in tune with your response, okay? What emotions did you display? Has this occurred more than once? 
What lessons can be learned from this experience? How do you feel at this very moment? How has your esteem, esteem been affected in any way? These are just some questions and there's some other um, general questions that you may think to formulate that may help you make the connections. Because again, sometimes my journaling as, as it will be with anybody that journals uh, is just because I need to get that peace of mind. Something has angered me greatly and I need that outlet. Other times I need to say, okay, I need to think long-term because I don't wanna keep facing certain situations or responding in a certain way. So now I need to make the connection of why do I respond when I'm around these people or I respond when I'm in these certain environments. And so having these structured questions helps me to make those connections. And from there, once I've identified by now I can start, as I mentioned about 10 minutes ago, uh, I can start finding ways to mitigate, all right, those, those behaviors and mitigate those uh, responses and find more healthier ways to deal with my unhappiness or my frustrations and things like that. All right. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about briefly about what we do in the community. You know, as mentioned, I'm the founder of Journaling Saves Lives. Our organization has distributed literally hundreds, like upon hundreds, upon hundreds of uh, journal notebooks to people of all ages and demographic backgrounds in our effort to promote journaling as a life, as a healthy lifestyle habit. We've distributed them at churches, libraries, schools, sporting events. I would go to sporting events, high school football games, you know, they, they don't, you know, that was kind of shaky this past year. I would go to other games. I would have my duffel bag and I would just stand outside the gate, duffel bag full of uh, journals, all right? Marked with our Journal and Saves Live as a reminder, uh, well, sorry, as a reminder to people to take a more proactive approach in your mental and emotional health, journaling, it's okay to journal. So I would stand outside with just like hundreds of them in a duffel bag, boom, people leave the gate, boom. That's our way of putting good energy into the atmosphere and, and helping people to realize, okay, this is this we're trying to enforce and trying to uh, instill into society a mindset of being proactive with our mental and emotional health. So we've done that, like I said, at schools. We, we, I used to do it at libraries, stand outside the library as people leave here. Take, take a proactive grip in your mental and emotional health. Uh, practice mental and emotional healthy habits. I would say different little statements when I would give them this. All right. Uh, definitely a church. You know, I would go visit other churches, even in my own church. They told me to stop passing them out of my church because they got a thousand of them. So they don't want me to pass them out of my church anymore. So when I go to other churches, you know, this is just my way of, uh, again, making that connection. Now, yes, we unapologetically promote the concept of journaling to parents of elementary, middle, and high school students. Y'all check this out. I'm, I'm, I'm so serious about this journaling as a healthy, a mental and emotional healthy tool uh, that I... Listen, I have parents that have told me they're six-year-old, they're seven-year-old, they're eight-year-old, they're 12-year-old, they're 14-year-old, they're 16-year-old, they're 17-year-old, have benefited from journaling. Yes, all the way down to like six and seven years old. Yes, I have parents that I told them, my kid is not going to say that. I said, listen, I give them different prompts and different fun ways to make this an engaging thing because whether you know it or not, kids deal with a whole variety of mental and emotional uh, health problems, okay? From all aspects, they deal with stress, they have triggers and so forth. And so why should they not be privy to this benefit? They're not too young, all right? And so this is why I take it so serious, like in my family, in my church, everywhere, even strangers. Hey, you ever thought about uh, having your child to start journaling? Uh, and one of the reasons too, is hard for parents to enforce something that they don't do themselves. So this is why I first you know, uh, seek to try to get the parents on one accord with this, all right? And so then once they get on one accord, they'll see the benefit of it, and then they'll pass this tool on to their children. Because I'm trying to see families, whole families, uh, heal healthy whole with, with great lifestyle habits, all right? And then especially the elderly population too, like even going into the, you know, before COVID, with this, to nursing homes, like, you know, doing little things with the elderly and all of this type of stuff, teaching them how to journal, because they go through things, and whether you know it or not, that, that's one of the highest demographic of people, people, and I guess according to, I, I guess, what, what is the elderly age started at? I believe now it started at 55, uh, but in my thoughts, uh, elderly person is like 60 or above, but I know uh, my mother was considered 
uh, elderly person technically she is because she's 56 now when she turned 55 she got her aarp card and stuff like that but i i tell them they, they're one of the most highest demographics of people that are committing suicide because of overwhelming mental and emotional stressors and that they don't have the proper outlets and ways to deal with that. So we're definitely behind taking care of everybody, but especially our young children and our elderly population, all right? And so uh, the next thing I just wanna do is as a brief, and we can take more like two or three minutes, it doesn't have to be five minutes, but what I want us to do is this. This is what I call an end of the presentation exercise. And so I want us to reflect on the presentation because one of the things that I'm a firm believer in, that we must be mindful of what's buying for our attention at any given moment, okay? And so this exercise is gonna help us gain awareness of all of the things that buy for our attention on a second by second basis. And this helps to promote mindfulness as I've been mentioning throughout the presentation, as well as teaching us how to overcome distractions through awareness of the distractions, okay? And so the exercise is this. I want you to pull out some paper or you can use your uh, electronic device, but I would like everybody to participate. And like I said, I just put five minutes, but we'll do more like uh, two to three minutes because uh, so, I don't want to keep you all too long, but I do want you to engage in this exercise. So we'll do three minutes like the first one. But I want you to reflect on the presentation, okay? And write down some of the internal and or environmental distractions that presented themselves to you during this lecture. What thoughts, ideas, feelings unrelated to this presentation vied for your attention? So even though you're reflecting on the presentation, I don't want you to give a recap of the presentation. I want you to write down what kind of thoughts, why you were hearing me talking about black history things in journaling. Were, were you thinking about what you were gonna cook for dinner? What you, were you thinking about how you have to pick up your daughter or your son from soccer practice, and that was interfering with you from receiving all that you needed to receive out of this presentation? Were you thinking about what time you gotta wake up tomorrow, or what you gotta do at 10 o'clock tonight? All right, so I want you to just for three minutes, pull out some pen, a ink pen, a pencil and paper, or your devices, and write down some of the things that you knew hit your, your thoughts in your mind that was distracting you during this presentation. Because and now I wanna say this, most people say, no, I paid attention to the whole thing. No, something somewhere, this helps us. When you force yourself to think, it helps you say, okay, yeah. When he was talking about that, I heard him say something about journaling, but then I started thinking I had to go pick up my teenage daughter from the library and I had to think, pick up my son from the mall. And so I want, you, this is gonna help you all to be mindful and to be aware, all right? Because the best way to overcome distractions is first being aware of them. That's, that's the way, you can then find ways to mitigate. So just write for three minutes the things, again, that were vying for your attention during this presentation. And I'll mention again, this exercise helps us to gain awareness of all of the things that vie for our attention on a second by second basis. And this helps to promote mindfulness as well as teaching us how to overcome distractions through awareness of distractions. You have two minutes left. <clears throat> you have a minute and a half left. And be honest, I know you may have caught a good portion of it, but if you were distracted in some way, write down what distracted you internally and externally, because sometimes could have been a, one of your kids come through and say, hey, mom, or hey, dad, or one of your friends just walked through the door, a coworker, wherever you at. So be honest about what those distractions were. <clears throat> and it's only something you're going to be reading. So there should be no uh, undue hardship in being honest about what was buying for your attention. You have one minute left. Forty five seconds. Thirty seconds. Remember, you're writing down 
what things during this presentation were vying for your attention that that caused you to be distracted and maybe miss some of the content that went for it you have 15 seconds Five, four, three, two, one. Time's up. So this is something that I would like for you all to start doing. Like if you have to sit through meetings or you uh, having a talk with somebody, once you're done, do this little debriefer exercise because it's going to help you be aware of, because sometimes we think we are listening. We think we're taking in information. And all of this stuff has a bearing on our mental and emotional health, all right? Because if you're always giving your attention to everything else in certain contexts, then that becomes stressful, even on a subconscious level. All right, so now I just want to give a little bit of contact information. Again, my name is Matt Johnson, the founder of Journaling Saves Lives. Uh, you can reach out to us at journalingsaveslives at yahoo.com. Uh, if you need, you know, any more journaling prompts, tools, or tips, or you, some of the information I shared, you know, I'll be willing to share this with you and email that to you. Just reach out to us. Uh, you can visit our website at the Church House of Love Ministries, fl.com. We have a section on there totally devoted to mental health resources. We have videos. Uh, we, we have hyperlinks that goes to Psychology Today and all uh, uh, NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illness, and several other things, all right? We have hyperlinks to our uh, <clears throat> Facebook pages on there. So please visit. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we're on YouTube. So please look us up and please connect with us. I, I pray that you receive something from this presentation. But one last thing that I would say to you is, please be mindful and hold yourself accountable to take what was said in this presentation and find some way to apply it, all right? So I'll now turn it back over into the hands of Ava because I see I've been spotlighted. Um, so <laughs> good thing I was smiling at the time. Thank you so much, Pastor Matt. I appreciate so much uh, you sharing today. And as many people were commenting in, in the chat, you know, now I'm thinking like, where are my journal books? You know, I, I have 10 different ones. You know, how can I, you know, know which one to consistently write in? Um, but really thank you for sharing that good information. We did have a couple of questions. Um, someone did ask, how are men at doing the journaling process? women to seem to be more open in expressing thoughts and feelings. So maybe you can speak a little bit about your experience with that. Yes, uh, it's like tooth and nails trying to get men to take that time, set that time aside to journal. Men by nature fall into more maladaptive behaviors, You generally speaking, than women. Like most of my seminars and, and things we do in the community is generally 95% women and 5% men. All right, and, and so I don't let that discourage me. I keep going after them, the men at my church, uh, because at the end of the day, you cannot force an adult to do anything. But I, I go after like the men that I see at sporting events and some of my buddies that I play intramural sports with, I always, hey, you've been journaling today, you've been journaling today, here's a new journal, here's a new journal. And again, over the course of time, I, I've, I've saw an increase and the response from males that I've approached that said, man, I've gave, I've given that a try. You know, it really worked. You know, I, I'm not as angry as I normally was because now I have that outlet and now I'm holding myself accountable. And your key word, you got to hold yourself accountable. They say, I've been holding myself accountable to take my little 10, 15 minutes a day so I can have my outlet. And so, but generally speaking, it, it's just something that women are just more apt to do, all right? But, you know, we're working on the men. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you for that. There was also the question of um, when you gave out the journals, do you give out point papers with them, with the journals? Yes, I, I usually give out, um, I usually type something up on Microsoft Word, like the prompt questions as I uh, share with you all on the screen, just something to kind of help to guide people. And I just stick it inside and just give it to them. So yes, that is something uh, that I do. Because it's very important because, again, I don't know whose hands that journal is hitting. You know, this could be somebody that's already been journaling, somebody that don't know anything about journaling. So I just try to be a little bit proactive in that aspect. So, yes, I do provide that. Right. Thank you so much. I hope this was um, as helpful for everyone else as it was for me, getting a lot of good feedback in the chat. And thank you for our awesome presentation. And so we just encourage you to, you know, continue to 
um, put in place some of these self-care tips that uh, Pastor uh, Matt shared with us today. Um, and we wish you all well.